My name is Steve Holmes, and I have the pleasure of being the Chief Bouncing Officer at Spring Free Trampoline. And on the screen today, you see some black boxes of people from around the globe that are part of the Spring Free team, and some who are allowing their face to be exposed. And those people are coming to us from China at 7 a.m. or in certain parts of Australia between 9 and 10 a.m. and New Zealand at 11 a.m. and uh, in the west coast of the United States, 4 in the afternoon, and here on the east coast, it's 7 p.m. And tonight, it is my pleasure, because it's 7 p.m. for me, to invite our guest, Mr. Chris Tufts, to join us tonight. Chris is a guy who, just so we're all warned in advance, you might think he's taken a gallon of Red Bull, but this is all natural. This is a guy who's got a huge amount of energy and passion about the things that he talks about. We're excited about engaging with Chris tonight. And Chris has written some books. He's written the book, The, the Millennial Whisperer. He's written the book, Savior Asks. Whoops, I got to get that in there for you which we can, we're going to try and dive into both of those things tonight because I think there's some great content for us to learn from. In addition, Chris is part of an ad agency called 22 Squared in Atlanta, Georgia. He's been part of the front end of lots of things digital in the very early stages of the Facebook community and other parts of it. So Chris Tuff, welcome to Jumping Into Conversation. It's a delight to have you with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm so psyched to be here. I wish I was on our trampoline right now, but the girls are on it. So uh, you'll just have to do with me standing still. Well, Chris, one of the things we like to ask our guests, because your girls, I think, are somewhere between 9 and 11. Is that about right? 10 and 12. Yep. 10, 10 and 12. 12. 10 and 12. So what we like to ask our guests on Jumping Into Conversation is tell us about Chris Tuff's the 10 or 12 year old. Yeah. So uh, what me as a 10 and 12, 12, yeah, 10 or 12 you, year old? you. So I actually, I just moved from Toronto to Boston and um, I mean, I, I, I was an identical twin, very you compelling. Still are, are you not? Yeah, still I still are. are. Okay, good. We're further apart now. Um, but my biggest passions at that point in my life were really um, ski racing and uh -huh anything dangerous, you know? And so, um, yeah, uh, ski racing is really what was my first big passion that started, um, at my ages of 10 to 12, we were never allowed a trampoline because my dad said they were way too dangerous. And we every single Christmas we, and I was the youngest of six kids. Not once did we ever have uh, a trampoline because well, spring free wasn't around back then. Well, we were probably, in fairness, the funny thing about that, Chris, is there was a guy, Dr. Keith Alexander, I don't know if Keith saw it tonight, but he was working on that in his backyard. So that far back, he's been trying to figure out how to make trampolines safe for the backyard. I love it. So, yeah, which is a lot of fun. We're going to have a little bit of fun here with some word association to get us warmed up. You okay with that? Yeah. All right. Baby boomer. Uh, my parents. All right. So... Let's we'll keep going. Generation X. Uh, you got to go back to the office right now. OK, I got to go back right now. But I'm right still, now. But I'm still at the office. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. OK, we'll go to we'll go to where your your heart is. The millennial. Free spirited. Free spirited. Interesting. Let's, we'll dive into that in a minute. So I guess there's you talk about two stages of the millennial. So is there a Gen Y? Uh, so then you have Gen Z after millennials. So all right, Gen Z. Okay. So millennial, like, so just let's break it down. So forty-year-olds down to really twenty-four-year-olds right now are in that millennial core group, and okay. then twenty-four and younger. That's the the that those are the Gen Zers. Okay, so I, I'm going to go back. Word association: Gen Z, TikTok, TikTok. Okay. I don't even know what that is. Oh boy, this is fun. You know, intergenerational. I mean, just in fairness, Chris, those four groups of people are trying to work together today. Exactly. So, so talk to me about that dynamic from your perspective and your experience. Well, so I, I think it's important to note, Steve, is that I, I first published the Millennial Whisperer three and a bit years ago, pre-pandemic. It was right before the pandemic. And a lot of the things that I espoused in the millennial whisper, I think, oh yeah, one of my favorite quotes is that millennials aren't the problem. They just expose a lot of the problems. And so a lot of the things that millennials want specifically out of leadership 
we all want. And those three, if you want to know what those three core things that millennials and Gen Zers want out of leadership, it's inspirational leadership, autonomy, and transparency. Those are the three characteristics. Okay, but hold on. Hold on. You're going to have to help me here. Yeah. Because I hate to self-assess. So inspirational leadership, you got to give me a little bit more meat because that sounds like a, I, that could be a catch-all and I might never qualify. So oftentimes, a lot of those inspirational leadership, autonomy, and transparency are oftentimes misinterpreted as different things. And the best way that I can equate uh, inspirational leadership is actually what why most leaders are not inspirational, and it's called LAE. Do you know what LAE is, Steve? No. <laughs> it's it's low-ass energy. And why oh, that's okay. important is we've got to be bringing high ass energy to all of our meetings. And the good news is, is Stephen, in our interactions together, you have HAE and not LAE. And so inspirational leadership is comprised of a few things. One is your energy level, right? So when you're getting people together, like get them, get them excited, you know, talk about where it is that you're going. But the other side, the easiest things that we can start implementing as leaders um, I talk about the importance of rewards and recognition, right? And, and rewards and recognition is an easy kind of switch that any organization can put in place to actually bring a little bit more of that inspirational leadership while also scratching this itch, which is real around millennials and Gen Zers of their need for feeling more accepted. Um, and there's a variety of reasons for that. The biggest of which is they, they were... They were they had participation trophies all the way along. They had snowplow parents get everything out of the way. I talk about how I've had parents come in and actually negotiate salaries on my younger employees' behalf. I'm like, get out of here, right? Like, so you know, there's two sides of rewards and recognition to become more inspirational. One is top down, okay. And, and my favorite example of a top down in employee recognition uh, reward is actually, it, it's out of a company out in San Francisco that's a software company, very sales oriented. So on the first day of every single person's month, Steve, what they do is, um, at the, well, it's actually on the last day, they will play the at bat song of that employee that's sold the most amount of software. Blue sirens will go off on the top of the ceiling and then they take a 12 foot big blue rooster on wheels that will sit next to that employee's cubicle for the duration of the month. They give away zero cash bonuses. They give away zero shares in the company. They give away a big blue rooster. And so, especially in that rewards and recognition space, I will say, you've got to figure out what's your big blue rooster. What's that thing that you're doing monthly, quarterly, or at least annually from a top down from Steve and the executive team down into your teams to actually recognize your employees. The other side of the rewards and recognition is peer to peer, right? So how can you actually create a system? And, and what I do in any of my team meetings, I start with snaps. And some people think this is cheesy. So I apologize if this seems cheesy, but I will just start my all hands meeting and say, listen, I want to give uh, snaps to Amy for coming to Atlanta, crushing those sales meetings and really go above and beyond. And then we just give snaps. And then what happens is each one of the other employees in that group will actually reward and recognize one another. So those to me are two. Because so yeah. you just covered a lot of area really fast because yes. I said to everybody getting started, Chris has is, is just got huge amount of energy and passion. We're going to try and keep up with him. Yeah. I want to be respectful for a group because when you get into that high energy here versus low energy, sure. I want to be careful to understand your perspective here. You know, there was a great book written by Susan Cain called Quiet, How to Get the Most Out of Your Introverts. One of the things I want to be respectful for in this process is some of my, some of our organization and, and, and in our are people who are introverts. So sure. the way in which high energy engages with them is a different than those who are like you and I, who are happy to be the experts. So talk to me a little bit about th that whole interaction. Sure. Okay. Well, there's two sides of that, right? One is if you're an introverted, let's just say you're a super introverted um, boss with a team of people under you, 
And you're like, listen, like, I just don't have that HAE, right? Like I, 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 I'm naturally more subdued. So I actually had a uh, dentist reach out to me and he was like, Chris, I love your stuff about the inspirational leadership, blah, 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 but I'm super introverted. Do you have any tactics that I can utilize to get my dental office, you know, fired up? And I said, music. Okay. What about music? Use, find something that will actually, it doesn't require you to get everyone to okay, use the music to do it. So um, what he did, Maybe. and he reported back about six weeks later, and he said, so Chris, holy cow, it works. And so every Monday morning, what he would do is he would play Shaka Khan's tell me something good over the loudspeakers of his dental office before all of his patients came in. And everyone would then go to the huddle room and just tell something good. And he was like, Chris, it requires nothing out of me. And I get to be my introverted self and people just tell me something good. So that's one side of it with the introvert versus extrovert. From an employee side, you're absolutely right. Some like, you know, especially with subcultures within your organization, you might find that they're very different than, you know, some of the other ones. So, you know, especially in software companies, like the developers are very different than the sales side. You know, the sales side, it's HAE. The, 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 the developer side is much more of like heads down to your point. And so one of the biggest things that we have to create is more of that genuine connection one-on-one -on -one with all of our employees. And the most important thing we can ask anyone on our team is let's just forget about work for a second and ask these people, what is it that motivates you? What gets you fired up? Let's forget about work for a second. What is it like, what, and I like to go, what, where, where is it that your dreams and purpose lie? And then when you, when they feel vulnerable, when they feel like they have a genuine enough connection with you as the boss, that's where the magic happens. And I, I mean, I'll even, I, I go as far to actually work with every single employee on their purpose statement. And we'll find in that process that their purpose statement is very different than what they do in their day-to-day -day job. So I'm like, okay, great. We got to find some other stuff to actually scratch that itch. So I think, okay. yeah. I want to dig into the purpose statement in a minute, but sure. I, I do want to ask a couple of questions. It goes back to your, your three points. Um, so you talked about inspirational leadership and, and I, and some key things that might measure that. Um, I think it's so critical for my organization. Um, I got to be careful. I say this when you want to be a leader, one of the things you want to have is genuine feedback. So how do you encourage millennials, G Gen Y, baby boomers? How do you encourage that intergenerational group to engage with their leaders to provide constructive and effective feedback? Because it's one thing to say they want inspirational leadership, it's another thing for the person to actually know whether they're delivering that. Sure. You've given us some highlights, but what yep. is the responsibility for the for the employee, for the for anyone within the organization to engage to give that feedback? So I think a lot of the, I mean, it's up to the leader to create that connection in the first place. I call it the art of the flyby. And it's not, it's so instead of your annual reviews or your weekly check-ins or monthly check-in or whatever it is. It's up to the leader to do that flyby with their employees. And, you know, in today's, you know, very remote world, like that's sending the text saying, hey, I saw that place you went over the weekend looked epic. I hope you had an awesome weekend just checking in, right? It's just that flyby of creating that genuine interest in their lives from the leader to their employee, right? The One of the biggest fallacies, especially with millennials and Gen Zers, that, that is that they don't want feedback. What they want is they want feedback in almost real time. And a lot of times our systems are set up to be either quarterly or annual reviews. So what they hear, there is some truth behind these generations being more sensitive. And I'm not going to talk about why that is, but when they go in for their reviews, they're like, all I heard was the bad stuff, right? So what I implore on, you know, especially leaders, and I, and I and I help a lot of young millennial leaders, right? Um, in this yeah, same I would, way, I mean, these days that that there's a huge number of those, right? Guys. And feedback is both positive and negative, right? So make sure that you're giving the props when those team members are doing well, but also ground whatever that feedback is in data. And I use an example. So Steve, let's just say someone on your team, let's call her uh, Peggy. 
Peggy decided that it was her time to do her first big presentation for uh, a potential, you know, buying group, whatever. right? Whoever it is, client, whatever. And Peggy gets up there and she botches the whole thing. It's horrible. She says, um, 32 times. She says, like, uh, 15 times. And you're having to give Peggy feedback. I see you've got to build a better sandwich and you got to go in and at least encourage Peggy for having the courage to go and do that in the first place. Cause it was out of her comfort zone. So it, it sounds something like this, Peggy, way, way to go to push yourself out of your element. I mean, just doing that was a huge step. Use the word and, and I took a couple notes of where you can improve. You said like 32 times, you ummed 15 times. That's definitely a place that we can work better. And then you end it with, and keep on going. Maybe the next time you practice this stuff in front of our team before we open it up to the general public. And it's through that feedback loop that we're able to create a little bit more of that encouragement, but also give them the data that they require as to objectively what was good and what was bad. So in the context of that, who, who did you choose to write Millennial Whisperer for? Who was your audience? So it was really extras um, for the Millennial Whisperer. And it's these, it's all of my friends that go to me because I mean, where Millennial Whisperer was born was I was after going through a lot of my own changes in my life and I shifted from being the digital and social person to putting all of my efforts into our 400 team members. And I introduced myself about nine months later around the fire at an executive retreat, average age being 45 to 55 year olds, all with big companies. I said, I don't really know what I do anymore, but I'm kind of like the millennial whisperer. And, uh, and then I shared my story. I sat down by the fire and these, these executives were looking at me and they're like, tell me what you're doing because the stuff I'm doing is not working. And I told them some of the things that I implemented and do on a daily basis. And they're like, wow, like that's actually pretty innovative. And then someone said, you got to write that book. And I wrote the book in about four, four and a half, five months. And that was, it was really with that catalyst that I, I went out to do it. And I was writing it for them. You know, really that kind of Gen X into the boomer space of really a lot of the things that millennials want, we've all wanted, right? Uh, if we break down some, some of those things. So if you had to flip your audience, stay yeah. with me, stay with sure. me, some fun here. I, I told you I wouldn't go off the script, but if we're going to flip our audience here, if you had to change the name of the book to the millennial encourager, yeah, I, your audience was millennials, what would you have said to them? A lot of it is about meeting in the middle, right? So, I mean, if I'm that millennial encourager, there are certain things, I mean, even within, and this is where we get in, the older millennials have a lot more of an interpersonal muscle built in because of they didn't get their cell phones until after college. I mean, they're 40. They had beepers in college, right? So they don't have that inner, they have an interpersonal muscle that younger millennials, I call them the Snapchat millennials, they were given a brand new iPhone account, uh, iPhone with a Snapchat account at age 13. And so they were much more reliant on technology for that interpersonal communication. And so I'm not saying that millennials and Gen Zers are the ones that have it all right. What I'm saying is we got to start meeting in the middle on a lot of these things. And so if I was the millennial encourager, I would talk about some of the things I talked to my team about, which is stop relying so much on technology. And I have, if they're within, if a client is within a 10 mile radius, you're going to get your butt out of your seat. You're not going to email them and you're going to drive over to see them at least once a week, Right. And it's actually through that stuff and these rules that I've created that we alleviate some of these things that millennials don't do nearly as well as Xers and boomers. But yet there's a lot of things that they do that Xers and boomers, I think, can learn from. So in, in the scope of that, OK, so now this intergenerational, how do we be totally respectful because on the cover of your book the millennial whisperer you gave all the stereotypes mm -hmm. right you gave all the things that millennials were blamed for and as you pointed out and you when you started i think you used millennials aren't the problem they expose the problem and so in when you think about how a team works together addressing the issues of inspirational leadership 
addressing the issue of kind of a, a positive work culture um, and transparency and autonomy, uh, uh, like in this changing COVID environment where all of a sudden people aren't in the same room together. It used to be in fairness, Chris, when I, when we opened our office, one of our offices, it was like, okay, we got trampolines in here. That's really good. People can bounce, but boy, we better, where's the ping pong table or where's this? And it's not about that, of course. No, it's not. Now, now it's hard to get people to come back into it. So what is that cultural connection that we need to make? I mean, I think it comes to an interpersonal level, right? And, and so, I mean, the cultural connection comes from leadership first, and every leader should feel that genuine connection with every single one of their employees, and it starts at the top. And I mean, just take how we met, at the, which is more of a transition into my next book. But, you know, I saw you at the next uh, at the side of the pool in the middle of Turks playing with your grandkids. And I was like, this guy's a good guy, right? Like, look at that. Look what an amazing relationship he has. And I heard your Canadian accent and I said, are you guys from Toronto? Right. And that's what started it all. Like just watching your ability to connect with those around you. And then our connection that now has transpired into this, like that's what it takes. I do think that it takes those types of leaders to set that precedent that then everyone needs to bring into their team. And the biggest thing that we have to start doing is taking a more vested interest into those people's lives. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to jump straight into your second book. There's yeah. a key word that I love, and I want you to talk about it because I think it's, in fairness, it's a, it's a gift that I think you have that, that came out at the poolside. I was sharing with somebody the other day. One of the things that, that I like is the word curious. I'm always curious. And the joke, folks, about the connection that, that Chris and I made at the pool is I never got to ask a question because he was just so damn curious. So talk to me. Talk to me about this concept of curiosity. Sure. Where is that rooted in? So I, I have a uh, slide in my keynote that in my 30 minute keynote that I'm now giving quite a bit of. And it's um, it, it's a quote that says curiosity is the difference between connecting and networking. And it's not. And this happens in all aspects of our business, both inward, right, with our people, asking them, what's driving you as a human, right? Like what, 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 but you start with some of those common things. For us, it was the Toronto connection. And then I told you a little bit about how my parents met at Dalhousie and some of those other things. And then we moved on to those other pieces, right? It's actually with those questions that the most profound connections end up happening. But a lot of, I call it a race to the middle in, in Savior Asks. And it's, how can you find that common passion point between you and that other person? And it's no different with a prospect that you're selling to or trying to network with or your employees on your team, right? And it's asking those questions, taking a genuine curiosity into their lives that the magic starts to happen. But a lot of people get stuck at that race to the middle. They, a lot of people call it small talk, right? And I had an executive recently say, I, I'm awesome at that, right? Like I, I can create that connection, but then I get stuck there. How do you, what, what do you do there? And I say, it comes down to one question and one question only. And I do this in almost every interaction to my wife and kids dismay. And it's, what's your dream? What fires you up? Whether it be my waiter that I feel like I have that great connection with, or, you know, the person I'm sitting next to on these planes that I'm traveling around, like, what do you really want? And it's actually in that, that I think the specialness happens. But interesting, I think, it, it, you know, that one might argue in your book, uh, save your ass that you talk about I have to be careful I say that last word man you yeah. made that really difficult <laughs> I, I'm, sorry. Design. I, I, I'm design. sorry okay I get it you're obviously in marketing and advertising but in the book one of the things in in the there's a side I hate to say this because my initial Canadian remember we're soft-spoken we're not yes. a, there, there was a little bit of come on this is way too over the top until you get to that word genuine and you talk a little bit about what it means to be genuine, like there's true, you at some point to be genuine, don't you also have to say to yourself, how would I feel if I was asking the same question or asked the same question? Yeah. I mean, I think so. Right. I mean, but I don't, I think we oftentimes get stuck in this place of what I would say is that race to the middle because no one's vulnerable enough to go to that next place, right? To, to take it to that next level because no one said that that's okay. 
And as I've been practicing what I preach in almost every interaction, what's astounded me, Steve, is how many people are willing to go there. And I've got so many great stories, but like uh, the, the example that I use even in the book is um, I, I was at Nike. Okay. And it was my first huge speech at Nike. People had flown in from all over the world, probably similar to what's who's on this call. Now we had people in from China, Mexico, Australia, every single market. And um, so I was super nervous going into it. It was a typical Oregon, Oregon day. It was 4.30 in the morning because I had to drive to Beaverton and I called an Uber and, and the Uber showed up and I, uh, with my assistant, I go running into the Uber and I slam the door and I'm like, burr. And this Uber driver turns back to me and he goes, how dare you close my brand new Camry door like that? And he just lit into me. He was like, show my car with some respect. And my assistant kind of whispers in my ears, said, this is a long ride to Nike. And this isn't how we want to start this day. And I, I took, Steve, I took a look around the Camry and I said, I whispered back, I go, watch this. And I, I saw in the rear view mirror, a Trinidad and Tobago uh, flag hanging from it. And I listened to the music and I heard steel drum music. And I, and I simply chimed in. I said, excuse me, sir, is that Trinidadian steel drum music? And his energy completely changed. And he goes, how do you know about Trinidadian steel drum music? I said, well, I've actually been dying to get down to Trinidad and Tobago. And there's this one kiteboarding spot right near the airport. He goes, so-and-so beach. And then for 45 minutes to Nike, we started going back and forth about his family and all these things. And, and when we got to Nike, he shared his contact information. He was like, Chris, please come visit my family down there, blah, blah, blah. And my assistant's just like, what just happened? How, like, what, what in the world? And that was genuine but, connection but in, happening. In fairness, in fairness, when you started, in fairness, when you started, you're because you, you turned to your assistant and said, watch this. You knew you were going to start. You didn't know how the re, it would be yeah. received and whether or not you would continue. So the genuine nature of your connection actually happened based on his first response. 100%. Is that fair? That's fair. So it, because that's, I mean, some of the connection. So let's go back to your first book because I'm jumping all over here because you're, you, you, I got to keep up with you. But yeah. empathy. Mm -hmm. and connection are two mm -hmm. words that you like to use together obviously yep. empathy is that that sense of sharing and feelings and and being curious and creating that connection talk to me a little bit about where you see empathy fitting into all of this process yeah i mean i think empathy is the backbone of a lot of it right and and the truth of the matter is that empathy comes more naturally to some of us than others and for whatever reason, we've all been brought up that we have to be all things to all people as leaders. And, and what I truly believe, Steve, is that we've got to actually really just embrace our strengths and build out our teams to actually play to those. Okay. And so within a leadership team, what I see actually working out a little bit better is you have someone that might not be as em empathetic, right? Just doesn't that EQ, that thing has always been a struggle for them. You pair them up. A lot of times they're much better at the order stuff and the operationalizing and all those other things. You pair them up with a more empathetic, inspirational leader and you actually co-lead those teams together and play to those strengths. And it's amazing to me how often as I get into the nitty gritty with some of the even you know more prestigious brands that I work with, how many of the wrong people, the, 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 people in their positions are in the wrong positions. And it's like, embrace these things that are your gifts and allow you to thrive with it. Because we can't all be that empathetic leader because it's not as natural. I think we all have to try to muster as much empathy as we can in today's day and age, but we shouldn't require that person to be that role within every single leadership structure. It, and are we creating environments, though, in today's social channels with everything so out there, when you use the word transparency, sometimes I, I think that in a, in, when you get outside of your circle, the, the risk of being too transparent, you named it in your book, you said, stop comparing your insides to other people's outsides. Yeah. Like, we're so out there sometimes, it's so transparent that, 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 it's, that it can actually lead to real conflict, can't it? Sure. Well, so transparency is one of the most people either interpret it as financial transparency, 
And I have these leaders that say, well, I don't want to show how much our profit margins are or how much salary everyone makes. It's like, don't worry, it's not financial transparency your team craves. Or they see it, they misinterpret as vulnerability. And they're like, I'm not going to cry in front of my people. It's not vulnerability. Transparency is context, Steve. Why are you making the decisions that you're making? It doesn't mean you need to disclose everything. It means that we have to go against a few of those things that we were brought up to believe, one of which being, if you lose a big piece of business, use the data and tell the story as to why you lost that business and what you're going to do better versus sugarcoating it as the the leader that's just going to shield them from everything. Why are you investing in the things that you're investing while sacrificing in other areas? Give them some of those back context and the data And you'll find that that transparency box is not only checked, but it ends up completely kind of changing the way that people will perceive you. So in the context of staff, go back to the word transparency for a minute and inspirational leadership and vulnerability. What is the responsibility on the flip side so that we, what are, what are each of us responsible for? when it comes to delivering against all of those things we want. We want that inspirational leadership. We want that transparency. But what what responsibility do we have in the process? The biggest piece is communication, right? And, and I am a huge advocate of that constant communication up, right, um, to your bosses. And, and I call it like almost like the open door policy where it's, you might not want, and this is especially within my teams. I'm like, you, you might not want to walk through that door, but you have to, it's a two-way street, right? It's up to you to actually go into that person's office or, you know, in today's day and age, send the text, send the email, set up the meeting to the, to, to help create a little bit more of that, because otherwise you're just going to get lost in the organization, you know, and you gotta, you gotta fight for your spot on, on these teams, right? I'm going to use this to reinforce something. When I do sure. my internal videos, I always finish to say, you know how to find me extension one, one, three, seven, or my email or my telephone number. And, and I'll often hear from some of you and you'll go, I'm really sorry. I know you're busy. And it's like, no, this is what it's all about. Exactly. Like, I, I, like, I don't get paid to do anything. I get paid to contribute thought and that thought gets shaped by each of you so right now chris we're having some fun internally love to hear your thoughts on this because because you're in the space we're having some fun internally on the word innovation Mm. because keith alexander who's on here somewhere um he created the spring free trampoline it's really hard to actually create something as innovative as he, as he did. And innovation isn't easy. And so we're having some fun. And so the, this week we've been working through an exercise where everybody gets to share what they think is innovative. Mm. What, what, what no blame, no judgment. You don't have to give an explanation what's innovative in your world that you've seen. Because what we're trying to say is what does the next level of innovation look like? And you can't do that in a, in a, in a silo. So communication, I appreciate mm. it. And folks, this is, this is really one of the key things I want to get out of our time with Chris is the three words, curiosity, connection, and communication. So mm. let's, let's dig back into that, that communication piece one more time, if you don't mind, because you, you've, you've said that one of the things that people want is autonomy. Mm-hmm. So in autonomy, what is your responsibility for communication? Within, a, I mean, within autonomy, so... I will tell teams that the bet, so I go back to my definition of autonomy is best brought to life through some of the qualitative that re- I used a lot of research to do. I didn't just guess at this stuff, right? I used a ton of research and part was quant and part was qualitative. And so I Googled the number one boss for millennials and sure enough, Forbes magazine called out this guy in Philadelphia, Ben Kirshner is the number one boss for millennials. And the, I called him up and I said, I just want to talk to you about autonomy. And he was the one that said, so Chris, have you ever seen the Under Armour campaign, Protect This House? And I said, uh, I think so. Tell me more. He was like, well, it's this rah, rah video. And it's all about this team, the importance of protecting this house and it gets you so fired up. And so anyone that I talk to about autonomy, first, you got to ask yourself, do you have a house worth protecting? Do you have a culture that people, when you actually give them the empowerment that they crave, that you have a house worth protecting, right? And so in application, what that looks like. Yeah, I got to say this because this is our team here. 
one of the best ways that I see this, Chris, is our customer service department, our people who interact with customers. And I will tell you, we have a great team who believe that our house is worth protecting. So thank you, everybody. Well, and I can, and I can see that, right? I was telling Amy, I think it was the first time that installers had ever brought, been bought lunch because I, so I bought them all lunch and we were, we were talking, I was like, you guys are incredible. It was two brothers, young guys that came by. You could tell they really cared, right? And not just because uh, they knew that I was, you know, talking to you, like they really care. You can see that all the way through your organization, right? Which that is special, right? And that is worth protecting. And so one of the things that he then brought up, he was like, we just got rid of um, paid vacation and we went to unlimited paid vacation. So instead of people going to their leaders, what, what I say is I said, it's up to you all to protect this house, right? So you guys figure out who's going to cover for who for amount, whatever amount of period. And, and so what happens is when, when one person leaves for two weeks to go to Bora Bora and comes back and the other person covers, they're going to then go somewhere for two weeks. And it creates this kind of balance um, within those ranks that is true empowerment. And so, you know, that whole thing with protecting this house, I think is, is really important. But the other piece that I'll also tell any group is like, once you have a house worth protecting, you got to keep only those 18 players. Right. And, and even within my teams, I say, if you're a B minus player, you're out. We all like, it is a privilege to be here and be a part of this thing. And I also have a, a, a no negotiate with, I, I don't negotiate with terrorists. Well, I want and, you to be careful how you yeah, say go that. Ahead. You know, I, I want to be careful how you say that. And I really say this seriously. One of the things that's so hard in this environment that we are in uh, is retention and, and resilience in the midst of this, this environment that's been so difficult to work through. Sure. Um, and, and so one of the things I want um, to make sure our people understand is, yes, we have a desire for each and every one of you to be an AT player, but we want it to be because that's what you want to be. And we mm. want to give you the equipment to do it um, because truthfully, we're in this climate where we have lost this connection, Chris. And this is one of the things I want to talk to you about is we've lost some of this connection. So when I read your book, Savior Asks. Oops, there we go, right there. I've got this. How do I get it on the screen? There you there. go. There. I said it right this time. One of the things that's so critical about this is that when you become work from home and work alone, you stop learning how to ask. Hmm. And sometimes that pressure builds up inside and you actually don't know where your voice should come from. And so we're going to jump into that in a second. But what I, I want to say, like, I mean, resilience in this the midst of what we've experienced the last two years unbelievably i mean resilience is a big part of your your communication is it not resilience and tenacity yeah that's what it all comes down to right i mean those are the two key traits that i'm trying to instill in my own daughters is resilience and tenacity and i do i think social media has had a, had a huge impact i call it my 70 30 rule in the millennial whisper which is 30 percent of your job's always going to suck Right. It's up to me as a leader to make sure that at least 70 percent is in your line, uh, in your places of get you fired up. Right. And in that kind of zone of passion and and excellence for you. Right. And so I'll actually have people take their job description and figure out what's in your 30 percent zone of suck and then what's in your 70 percent. So you don't after three days of doing Excel for me, which is in my 30 percent zone of suck, anything budgeting and numbers oriented. It's not like I'm just going to go up and quit because I know that's in the place that I just need to power through to get to the other side. And it's when, Steve, when when I've had some organizations, uh, I mean, since this, is this being posted anywhere? I've had some very prestigious pre uh, brands. Don't, don't, don't just stay, stay general. It'll, it'll yeah, get out so there. some very prestigious brands, I'll actually bring up a panel of some of their all-star young leaders and I'll, for, I'll ask them, is 70, 30%, is that the, the ratio that you have here? And uh, in this one instance, they said, yeah, it's 70, 30 the other way. There's so much, we came here to do blank and there's so much bureaucracy that it's really only 30% that actually excites me. And I said, that's, that's fine, that's okay. And they're kind of like timid about uh, disclosing that to this group of leaders. I said, now to, I turn to the leaders, I say, it's up to you all to help you're a massive organization with a lot of different jobs and things. It's up to you all to help satiate a little bit that craving for some of those other things 
within your leadership ranks. So allow people to actually do things outside of your one group if they want to do that. You know, and maybe that's in, you know, uh, off hours or, you know, one of the more contentious things I also encourage is, you know, allow your employees to pursue those side hustles, right? To, to right. I want, I was waiting for you to say it. Yeah. I was waiting for you. And some it. places won't even let me talk about that. And oh, I'm like, no, I no, think no, it's no, so no, important. No, no, no. In your book, you say everybody should have a side hustle. Yeah. What, what you don't say, and what I, I want to dig into a bit here is it doesn't have to be monetary generated. No. no. So, because I'm going to, I, Cheryl and I, we were chatting, you've met my wife, Cheryl, we were chatting, yes. about this, we were talking about side hustle. And she said to me, you do not need any more side hustles. <laughs> <laughs> Independent of that, she said to me, I hope that he means volunteering. And I said, I'm sure that's part of that because Cheryl's a big person when it comes to volunteering. So when you talk about a side hustle, what should people be looking for in their side hustle, whether it's paid, whether it's volunteered, whatever sure. it is. So one of the, I mean, I, so every, I put it into the context of currencies and then, so your currency is that thing that you get paid to do. If you're head of operations at Spring Free, your currency is logistics, you know, how to get, you know, trampolines from and the different parts from New Zealand and all that stuff, right? Like that, that is your currency. And the only way that we can evolve our currency as we change as human beings through life, oftentimes we get stuck in these tracks, right? And I, I found this with dentists, especially, right? They're like, well, I'm a dentist and I don't even really enjoy this anymore. Like what, how do I bring passions into this? And so I think it's super important that at all times we're constantly curating these passions on the side. And one of those passions to your point, Steve, is to just accommodate for whatever that evolving purpose and passion that you have in life might be. And I think I would say 70% of the time when I implement this with my team, it's nonprofit in nature right? So how can they actually do something that is more um, focused on doing good out there? That's also in domain with those things that you want to be practicing, right? Um, and then, you know, the second passion is more in line of just practicing neuroplasticity. So learning a new language, learning a new instrument, whatever that is, just getting your brain to fire these synapses that might be going dormant. Um, and so, that the, the only way, so let me put it in the context of me, my currency was, I was the digital and social guy, right? I was one of the first guys to work with Mark Zuckerberg. That's why everyone reached out to me. And then um, I, I was no longer passionate about that anymore. And my kind of my, what I did was I, I want to have a bigger impact. And so I'm going to write a book and that then over, a, you know, I, after it sold a lot and blah, 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 that then became my currency. That was actually right in line with where my passions had evolved to. And there's nothing more beautiful to me than when, when your passions, your purpose, and profession all overlap. But that takes work, right? And so I'm going to quick, uh, I know that was a lot of stuff. Okay. Your purpose, you, back, you have a purpose statement, and I'll let you share that purpose statement, but you have a purpose statement. Has that purpose statement evolved? It just evolved. It just, so it got more precise. So my purpose statement for everyone listening or watching is to inspire and connect. And I've had that purpose statement for now almost 14 years. And uh, as I've gone out, especially- so hold on. You, had, you had that purpose statement bef when you were doing social. You were yeah, trying to inspire, to inspire and connect. Okay. All right. Yeah. Interesting. And, and it was actually when I was talking to a pretty well-known entrepreneur- as I was trying to get through his gatekeeper to talk to this person um, who's in the news very often, um, specifically around Twitter. Um, and uh, it was his gatekeeper. And they, they were like, so what, I mean, what is, what is your, what, why, what's your superpower? And I said, my, my absolute superpower is in any sort of interaction. I create this genuine connection with that other person to where I can help unlock those passions in them. And then be that spark or catalyst to then help them pursue that. And, and that's ultimately, and that's why I, I've been so successful in my ability to, to network authentically because I'm always trying to help people. I'll do anything in my power to help those people achieve their dreams. And a lot of times I have something in my resources to then 
be that catalyst to then get them to pursue that. So your reason for connection is not self-centered. No, no, I want not. And that's why save your asks, I think is so important because we've got to start saving our asks and go into more interactions with the sole goal of being genuine connection. If that is the outcome, right? If that is that thing that we're trying to create, you'll end up being 20 times more successful and you're a, bit, a byproduct of that is you end up doing business together. Much like me being here tonight, Steve, right? And, and I, I think it's important to note that you will be donating to an amazing charity. We're going to actually be able to give away a Make-A-Wish to Make-A-Wish Georgia because of this conversation tonight and your generosity. But I never approached you with the intention of that happening, right? Or no. getting a free trampoline off of you, whatever it is, right? It, but, it's, but I mean, I, I too have a purpose statement. Life is about giving and I will attempt to give generously and intentionally so that others may benefit. Um, and, and so, you know, our, your giving is a benefit to us and we're our joy of giving back through something that's passionate for you, make a wish. We're delighted. So congratulations on what you're doing with make a wish as well. How do people develop a purpose statement? I mean, there's some of the people here who are saying, you know what, come on, now you're getting into this airy fairy stuff. Yeah. Why is it important and how is it easy to do? So I'll send you my exercise. It's actually page 92 of the Millennial Whisperer. And it's a series of questions that I bring everyone through. Um, like, where is it that you lose sense of time, right? What's the one thing that you could do all day, every day? And you then end up going through this process that starts with two, and then it needs to be short. What drives me crazy are these long-winded purpose statements where it's like, I don't even, you can't even remember it. Right. So like, you got to keep it. I think impactful. Well, forgive me. Forgive me then. No, it's not that yours isn't that long, but you know, so that purpose statement, but yeah, page 92. And then, I mean, there's no one better than Simon Sinek and uh, he has an amazing workbook. Um, this, I think it's, this is your why, which is the workbook version um, of his, you know, purpose oriented book that he really kind of set that foundation and uh, if it's diff if you can't come to your purpose statement using my short exercise, I really encourage you to get that workbook from Simon Sinek. I, I I'm pretty sure it's this is your why, and that'll take you to a place where you end up coming up with uh, that. You thing. you and you and I have had uh, some debates recently or discussions about that start with why book where start I with why like, yeah yeah where I feel like right now there's a huge demand on all of us which is we're really desperate to say you know what how and when you know like it's it's you know we've it's just so exhausting what we've been through sure. talk to me really quick I know our time is running short and I want to be respectful and allow people to ask some questions but Talk to me quick about the, your your strategy towards goal setting and specifically what you call smartest goals. Yeah, so uh, the biggest thing I think with like goals, I feel like need to be broken up, and um, I like be doing goal setting of three things at a time, right? And there's no more than three things at a time that we can actually achieve and, and keep um, organized, and so. And a lot of my three things at a time are very short term. Like, I don't even know if I believe in super long term goals. Um, and so one of the things that um, I try to tell everyone around me are the three things that I'm working on, on in, in any given day. And so it allows me to actually tackle that um, in the moment uh, it, with, with knowing that I'm working towards something larger. I mean, for me, my, my goal is really more in line with my purpose, right? So it's always evolving and, and changing there. So, um, yeah, so that, that's, that to me, I feel like is the importance around goal setting. But you, you use the word smartest with an acronym. Some people have heard it before, but, but really quick, run us through it. Yeah, so it was uh, actually through a guy I interviewed for the book. His name's Jason Trotline. And um, so, you know, he is a serial entrepreneur, started a veterinary clinic that he ended up um, selling for quite a bit of money. But he, everyone knows what SMART goals are, I, I think, for the most part, right? So they're specific, they're measurable, they're achievable, they're relevant, and they're time-bound. 
And one of the things that fails to take into consideration are the EST on it, right? Which is exciting. So is this goal for me exciting to achieve? Um, seasonally appropriate, right? So can I do this at this time or in the amount of time allocated, right? So like if you're 60, you're not going to become a, uh, an Olympic weightlifter, right? So it's not seasonally appropriate. So you shouldn't even go after that. And then the last one is transformational. And so will this actually transform your life in a meaningful way? And those are the things that I feel like we forget to put onto some of these things that we put out into the world. It's interesting. Sometimes, though, we when we look at the term smartest, we become inwardly focused and we don't often think of it in terms of how somebody might also receive our, our, our being smart, i.e. We, we set goals that we go, hey, we're going to have the smartest goals and they're self-focused and they don't always take into consideration others. How, mm -hmm. how do you best manage so that your goals are consistent with those around you and the, and the company's goals? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's where you have, I mean, I have three really sets of goal systems, right? I've got my personal goals, I've got my family goals, and I've got my professional goals. And I think you need to separate them out um, and I have an accountability group, a mastermind of uh, seven other leaders in Atlanta, and we hold each other accountable to those. So I think accountability is a huge part of goal setting, uh, but we actually will do monthly check-ins and give a score between one and 10 to each one of those things. And so to me, how you do it is you separate them out and you always have to have one that's professional in nature. So look, I think what's fascinating, we're getting close to the end. And, and if everybody, if you've got some questions, get ready, because we're going to time in. I, I, I want to be respectful of Chris's time. We'll have a hard stop at eight. Chris, you should know half of these people. Uh, well, not That's not true. Some of these people live in Toronto. Of course, the Toronto Maple Leafs are playing an NHL hockey game. Oh, tonight. We're all terribly disappointed that I didn't cancel, but that's okay. We're having a good time. Chris, when you talk about connection when you talk about vulnerability when you talk about you know these types of being curious when you talk about genuine relationships ultimately the goal presumably in your book you talk about sustainable relationships mm. sustainable relationships and and you identify four things take us through those four things i think i mean you've already talked a lot about the first two communication and vulnerability but I think the last two, to me, are really... What are the last two? You have to tell me. Last two. two see, he, 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 I think somebody goes for the book. <laughs> oh. Uh, <laughs> no. No, this is... My <laughs> sister did edit the whole thing. Oh, Thank okay, goodness. Okay. The last two. Res, res, reciprocity. Reciprocity. Without, yeah. without scorekeeping. Mm -hmm. And staying in tune with their life, their changes, the personality, mm. the professionally, all of those things. Talk to me about what it means to have a sustainable relationship. Because yeah, so create that, me yeah. that is at the heart of being genuine. Um, so what's interesting about how most people approach like networking is they see it as one-sided, right? And that's why Savior asks is the call to action to go in with the intention of genuine connection. And after I interviewed some of the world's best networkers, what I found was that creating relationships is really easy. What's difficult is sustaining them, right? And we can actually use, I'm not, I probably shouldn't go on my tirade about what Shawshanking is, but Shawshanking is this idea, just like Andy Dufresne wrote a letter a day in order to get the Shawshank prison funded. Uh, he wrote a letter a day, and it was actually through that that two years later, he got his first check for $200. He didn't stop there. He kept going. And relationships are the same way. We've got to be actually giving out into the world without that notion of getting something in return. And it's not, we all have seasons of life that, that are going to be, you know, whether from a receiving side, when you just graduate from college, there's not that much you can do. So you're going to actually be going through a season of life of taking more of that reciprocity versus giving. Um, and then you change into this more of this season of giving. And I approach every relationship that I will do almost 30 gives before I go in for an ask. And we all live somewhere on that ask continuum. Asks either come really easy to us, which means we're most likely an ask hole, or we let the ask pass us by. 
and I'm way over here, right? I'll do 30 gives before I even go in for an ask because by the time I go in for the ask, it doesn't even seem like an ask. It's like, yeah, of course I'm going to do business with you because we have such a gen, like you, you, you bring like, yeah, yeah, of course there's nothing ulterior in that. And so, you know, that doesn't necessarily work for short-term sales cycles. Oh, uh, you're on mute, Steve. But, but in the, I, I want to be careful. You say I do 30 before I ask you're one of the things that I thought was so powerful in the book is, is this idea of without scorekeeping. hundred if, percent. If you keep giving, th then the, the, that it isn't asking. Yeah. Because you, you actually get the risk that re you get the res reciprocity. reciprocity, get the reciprocity without even sometimes knowing it. And you end up becoming friends, right? Like, and that's how all of these stories end up right that these people end up becoming friends and and some of those things turn into but most of those don't turn into any sort of business relationship and that's great right because you end up like i think that where the biggest disparity lies today is that that genuine connection right like that thing that we all purport to do on social media but we don't actually practice and so yeah Listen, it's been a delight to have you. We're down the last couple of minutes. If anybody wants to uh, raise their hand for a question, Erica, you, you're the you're the monitor here. I'll do my best, but I got a very small screen. Look, you got. I, I'm going to give you your last elevator pitch. You've got this great group of people who are committed, who have been amazing with our customers. Continue to build and protect our house. What would you share with them as they come through the change? Goes back to your comment about staying in tune with the changes of life every one of the people you see on these various screens is going through certain changes whether it's mm. working transitioning from working from home coming back into the office whether it's a, a new kind of tension in in circumstances what, what would you share with them yeah i mean my biggest piece is to start curating some of these passions that we may have neglected after the age of like fourth grade Right. And let's bring a little bit more of those passions into our life or even into our day to day job. And, you know, I'll end with one quick story is um, there was a dentist that I was speaking to in the middle of um, this big dental summit that I was the keynote for. And we were skiing and I grew up skiing on Owl's Head, like bombing the mountain. So we were bombing the mountain together. And uh, I was like, what do you want? What do you really want? He was like, I want five million in sales. I was like, yeah, right. What do you really want? And then it wasn't until our seventh ride up that he goes, all right, fine. You want to know, Chris, what I want? I want to be a high school football coach and I want to do keynotes like you. And I said, yes, there it is. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to help you write the keynote on how dentistry is exactly like high school football. Not only that, we're going to bring high school football into your dentist. You live in Austin, Texas. You are going to put blackout under your eyes. You're going to talk about not only that difference between offense and defense, but during the group huddles, you get everyone fired up and then you're going to give away as your rewards and recognition an engravable MVP trophy. And then the other thing we're going to do is when your son, who's just been born at this time, um, when he's five years old, you're going to give yourself enough flexibility to actually coach his football games and see him all the way through high school football. And so I use that as an example of these things that we may have neglected a long time ago. We've got to bring them back. And there may be even ways that working in an amazing place like Spring Free, you can bring it into a little bit more of your jobs. Amen. Terrific message. Any questions before we let this man go? There's a couple of people who've got their hands up and a couple in the chat. So um, Erica, I'm going to leave it to you. You're going to have to unmic yourself. Here's a question that came. The, do people in business professional environments expect genuine connection or are people predisposed to expect leverage through networking? Huh. What is the best way to break down beyond beyond the genuine intent and interest? Uh, so that one to may me, be long, to, but the, you may have to record that one and bring it back to us because I'm not going to keep you too long. Yeah, well, I mean, if you were to summarize that, what would that be then? I think what the person's asking is, have we created an environment where people expect in networking that they're, they're trying to get something out of it versus a genuine yes, relationship? A hundred percent. So yeah. you have, it's I your, mean, it's your predisposition has yeah. to how you change their expectation. And it's, it starts with you and you can right. do it immediately. Right. I mean, and I say networking events, screw the networking events, right. For the most part, outside of trade shows and those things that are necessary to your business, like, Go, go into every single interaction every single day as a, a way to actually genuinely 
connect with those around you. And what you'll find is that every single person around you in your day to day has something in their network that can that will actually benefit your life and those around you. And so use every interaction as that way to create those genuine connections versus going to those networking events. And you know, when you take that first move towards genuine connection, people will follow suit because people are craving it and it'll automatically set you apart from the competition. Mm. Okay, there's a couple of hands raised. I think Lisa, I see one, I see another. Uh, is it Sarah? Who is it? Sorry. Sam, close enough. Sam. Any Sorry. S name you can name. All right, Sam, close. you got it. You go first and then Lisa, and then we're gonna be out of here. Uh, so, so much of this has been about genuinely connecting with other human beings. And I find that as a customer service representative, it's a fairly easy skill for me. But what are some of the healthy boundaries that you think each employee should have with not just our customers, but each other when it comes to these connections? Yeah, I mean, every culture is different, right? And and I would say that it's there that that's where I think there are blurred lines. Um, but I now more than ever before, you've got to be, I think, careful on where those lines live, right? So um, understanding and taking into context what your culture is, first of all, uh, but a lot of the things that I'm espousing, it really, it does take you to a place of vulnerability, but it's less about you and more about what it is that you're trying to seek out of them. And, and talking about our dreams, talking about our real core passions in life, like that's all stuff we, we should be talking more about. And so if it sounds like it might be crossing the line, it most likely is, right? A lot of the things that I'm proposing, it's more about, right, that, that foundation of what a genuine connection, whether it be you and um, you know, uh, your eight-year-old daughter or, or whatever it is, right? So um, asking those right questions, I think, is critical to, to getting you to that next place. Uh, and the other piece is, you know, finding that common passion point, right? And a lot of times it's sports, right? Or, or some of those other things, right? So make sure that those things that um, you want to create that common connection around is easy, you know, it, a more, a lot of, like I watch Sports Center. I'm not that passionate about sports, but it creates like at least that last ditch thing. Be like, oh man, the Maple Leafs last night. I can't believe it, right? Like at least gives them something of that commonality between you and that other person. Lisa, we'll quick with, you'll be the last one. And then I have one closing question and then we'll go offline. Erica, after Chris answers my last question, go for it, Lisa. Hi. Um, Hi, Lisa. Kind of along the same idea, I guess, but... For someone who's very introverted, how do you um, make that connection with them? Like if they're just not going to, because if they're introverted and someone like me who's very extroverted, I can maybe scare some of those people, yeah. right? Which yeah. happens. So <laughs> do you? Do yeah. You, no. And you, I have the same impact on people as you can imagine. And I'm married to one of the biggest introverts you've ever met. Right. And, um, and that's taught me a lot, really. I mean, in um, knowing <laughs> when it is that I can go passion tirades and knowing when not, and I get my energy. I'm essentially as an extrovert collecting coins from all the introverts through the day. And I've got to be very cognizant of that. Introverts are holding their coins like this saying, don't take my coins. Right. But it doesn't matter when we get to these places of like our dreams, of our passions, it doesn't matter whether you're introverted or extrovert, everyone wants to share in that. And so I would say it might take you a little bit longer to get to that middle point and then to get to that foundation off of which you get into the, where I think where the magic happens. And so being patient in that, but once again, that curiosity and asking those questions, and it might take a little bit longer, but asking those right questions will get you to the same outcome. Um, so. Listen, Chris, to have you with us, I'm going to give you a chance to do a little bit of a pitch. You know, sure. Chris and his, uh, some of his friends in Atlanta are trying to do something very, very special. I don't know whether somebody will watch this and say, man, I want to help them. 
So yeah. Chris, share with us really quick what you're doing with Make-A-Wish in Atlanta and what you're trying to achieve, given the fact that, that, that people in Atlanta have gone two years really without a Make-A-Wish. Yeah, so uh, a friend and I, it actually started before COVID, and because so many people are moving down to Georgia, a friend and I got together, he's in my mastermind group, and um, he turned to me and said, Chris, there's a backlog of a, a thousand wishes in Georgia right now. I want you and I to create an event where we take all of them out on one night, all of them, a thousand of them. So we're going to have to raise like 2.2 million dollars. And we're going to take out the whole backlog of wishes and wish them in one night. And this is all, I just got goosebumps. Um, and so this is all happening on May 13th uh, in Atlanta. We got, we have two wish kids, uh, kids who both got wishes um, that then got them on the finals of uh, America's one America's got talent. And then, um, uh, one of the other big shows and they're performing. And then we're going to announce at this dinner with 380 people there that we're going to grant a thousand wishes and take out that backlog of, um, thing of wishes. So the, yeah, that's what we're going to do. And we're going to do everything in our power to achieve that. Listen, if you're listening out there and you want to participate in that way, I guarantee you this guy can be connected to. Yes. And you can tell them how out there you can get connected to Chris. Tell yeah. Them. So the best way to connect with me is actually, uh, I mean, if you want instant, it's anything that hits my phone. Uh, Email is not that great, but I've gotten better at it. Um, so the best way is on Instagram at tough, T-U-F-F-2-2. And I respond to everything. So if you have like one-off questions that you didn't feel comfortable asking here, like I'm totally happy to spend time or, you know, hop on a quick um, FaceTime or whatever it is to, to help answer those things. But tough two two T U F F two two on Instagram. And then my email is Chris at Chris tough dot me, uh, C H R I S T U F F dot me. And yeah, I mean, I'll leave everyone with just, I'm, I'm not out to try to become famous or try to make a bunch of money with this thing. Like, I truly want to change the world. And that's when Steve asked me to come on this. I was like, what better place? Like I've already seen the impact that Spring Freeze had on my daughters. Like absolutely. Like what an amazing privilege it is to speak to to all of okay. you today. So we're gonna have fun, Chris. You can, Erica. You can take us off the air. But Chris, I anytime somebody says that that your kids have had fun, you have to meet Dr. Keith Alexander. So Keith, turn your camera on wherever you are. <laughs> figure out how maybe the rest of us have to turn ours off. But Keith, you have to speak there, oh. to this. You have to speak and you got to turn your camera on, Keith. And 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 Chris, I'm going to introduce you to one of the, in my humble opinion, one of the Gosh. humblest, one of the humblest, nicest, most innovative individuals in the world, Dr. Keith Alexander. Chris. I love it. Keith, so <laughs> good to meet you. Chris, nice to meet you. That was really inspiring. I've got two pages of notes here. Awesome. You do really well. You scare me to death because I'm an introvert, but you do really well. <laughs> Carry on with what you're doing. Well, thanks for all that you've done. You've unlocked some amazing things in both my daughters. And so I will say one of them's got the backflip nailed and the older one, who's actually much more gymnastically inclined, um, is not quite there. And it's creating a little bit of tension. But I think we'll both be there soon. <laughs> okay, well, Keith and I, Keith and I, if this is anywhere on the public record, we believe in one at a time and no flips. Right, Keith? That, that's, oh, right. that's right. That's scary. That's me, right. No yeah, flips. That's... No flips. <laughs> yeah, they don't, yeah, they yeah. aren't doing backflips, I promise. Okay. Okay. Just be careful. <laughs> Keith, just really quick, you're well. Everybody loves to hear from Keith, you're well. I'm well. Uh, New, New Zealand's doing just fine. All New right. Zealand's a great okay. place to be at the moment. Yeah. Chris, Chris, yeah, we want to add, bring one more guy in here because everybody cares about you. Norm O'Hara, you got your camera on over there in China? Because I'm sure you're around here somewhere, Norm. I saw your name. Norm, uh, Norm was a student of mine in university. Uh, <laughs> And he put his hand up once, Chris, and said, you know, I see you're kind of doing something in China. My wife and I would like to go to China, you know, from a business perspective. So Norm's been there for a long time with his wife, Michelle, and their three kids. <sighs> I, just give me a second. I'll get there. I always like to think backwards. I always, Aria has a special place in my heart, but so does Gracie and so does Martin. So I am known as Bear Uncle Steve because once I brought them a gift of a stuffed bear. So anyways, there's nothing else. Norm, everybody wants to know yep. how you're doing. We're doing okay here where we are. There's no lockdowns, no delays. So what you see on the news is true. 
but it's only true in one spot. So mm. yeah, it, don't, uh, well, let don't me fret, that, trampolines that one, are flowing. <laughs> that, that one spot is pee, pee in the ocean when it comes to the whole country. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a big deal compared to Canada, but it's uh, it's just small here. Yeah, everything's normal here. Well, there you go. For Listen, now. everybody, terrific to be with you, Chris. Once again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, all the best to your wife and your... One interesting fact, you heard Chris say that he's an identical twin. If I'm right, he's, I think, married to an identical yes, twin. Yes, for both right identical twins. Small yes. pre percentages. Yeah. Chris, great to be with you. Uh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And uh, to every one of you around the globe, thank you for all you do. Chris, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. So it's always a test. We're down to one screen. Model's going to try and be here last. We know models. Sitting